<laughs> slept in. <laughs> Only a loser would sleep in. That's for losers. I haven't slept in anything in, I don't know, a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, that Does that sound like a success story? I have a hundred people waiting for me in a webinar, but, you know, I just slept in. I mean, they were just not that important. No, um, so we'll get going, but who cares about the sob stories? But just a technical problem, five minutes before... The webinar started, this PC's um, internet access went down. Hey, not a problem. Reboot, go get the coffee, come back. Still won't connect. All my other PCs are connected. So um, one of my ser internet service providers is offline. So I think it's my, my Comcast. So, hey, not a problem, right? I've redundant everything. Ah, oh, well, just switch over. Switch over to the AT&T, which I did, and there was like an adapter error and, you know, you know how those things go, right? All right, so I think you have sound. I think you have charts. Could you? Yep. Yeah. Good, good. Well, I want to thank you right off the bat for your loyalty. I want to thank you right off the bat for your patience. Um, hanging around in a half an hour, um, is cool, man. Thank you. Honestly, thank you. That's really cool. Um, all right, so I don't quite have everything up and running, um, but um, looks like I got one of my charting platforms up. Um, what would you like to do in the next 45 minutes of our time? I could see that lots of great trading uh, in the time that I've been away. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful, right? In the uh, in the half an hour I've been offline, a um, million dollars has been won and lost. But I suppose that's why you there there is a lesson as a trader. Um, and I'm just going to fire up some other things in the background while we're talking. But um, I have redundant everything. So I have. Two internet connections. Uh, one is a Comcast and one's an AT&T. One comes in at 60 megabits per second, which in America is ridiculously fast. Everywhere else is pathetic, but, you know, America is the greatest country in the whole world. 60 megabits a second cost me a ton of money. And the other one comes in, com um, different wire and everything comes into the house uh, as AT&T. And I also have um, a hot swap swappable computer ready to go. It runs eight computer screens. Uh, I took it out of the box, I don't know, three years ago. Um, you know, com completed the Windows, you know, install or whatever is required when you have a new computer. And then I installed MT4 and, you know, all my EAs and templates and stuff like that. And then I shut it down and put it back in the box. <laughs> <laughs> what a fool what kind of idiot buys a computer custom made computer that runs eight screens installs MT4 and puts it back in the box and sticks it in the closet well someone that says hey if I'm in the middle of the trading day and Windows wants to do an update and it just blows everything out and a PC won't boot throw the computer away pop the new one in and I'm good to go Yeah, so it, it reminds me I haven't backed up in a while, and so I'm going to move over, move everything to Google, and uh, all that kind of stuff. All right, so you got some charts. We can do some technicals. Um, I thought maybe just to make it interesting, we could scalp using binary options. Yeah. Hey, Joseph, did. Uh, did you get that email? I responded to your response on the response for that thing. Sort of a plan B. Okay. I know you've had a crazy week, so I don't know. I was just, I don't know. I, I had a cigar and I was thinking about you, and I don't know. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go it alone. 
right? So anyways. Uh, so what do you guys think about um, scalping with a binary? Um, you know, does that sound interesting? Uh, but the problem is I might only get one or two trades that we can follow through on in the next 45 minutes. Um, you know, like the the last one that actually has popped up, um, you know, we might have caught it if uh, if I didn't have the PC problems. But um, this pullback to the weekly central 3A2 cluster, that's a scalp if I've ever seen one. Okay. So, for example... Uh, you're bear, right? Right, there's the high of the day, London Open. Here's the low for the day. Okay, if you're a bull, um, you know, I feel sorry for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a pip ain't one. So um, I would rather be a bear, both technically and fundamentally. Um, this pullback is a 3A2 of yesterday's trading range, which is basically today's rate, uh, trading range. So I, often I'm looking for a FIB. You know, that's a FIB. That's a 3A2. Um, and then you got the weekly central. Okay? All of these things are um, resistance. Can be resistance if you're already a bear. Okay? So, you know, catching a pullback and scalping it off of that just on a five-minute cycle to me, is very much uh, scalpable. Now, my style of scalping is interesting, I think, because I, most scalpers swing both ways like a broken gate. And you can do that, and, you know, I'll admit I, I'm, I'm guilty of doing it. You know, I've done that this week where I'll look at a London Open and I say, okay, I'm a bear, but we're 40 pips away from resistance. So I would long it. Pick up 25, 30 pips and then flip and drop it the other way because I'm just short-term long but long-term short. But you don't have to do that. Do it that way, and the vast majority of my trades are in the direction of my bias, and my bias is set either by my long-term charts like, let's say, a four-hour or a daily, okay, um, um, or my fundamental bias, which is set by global macroeconomics and central banking policies. Now, I'm, I'm a bear, okay, and I look at it this way. The top of the market is a 50% retracement. Four-hour wants to cycle down, okay, and we had divergence. Okay, so as a bear, what, what more do you want, right? So usually if you miss stuff like that, you're just not looking for it, right? And isn't that the problem for most newer traders? They don't even know what they want to look for, and therefore, you know, you're wandering, wandering, and hopeless night. Let me tell you about heartache and the loss of God, wandering, wandering, and hopeless night. Out here with no fundamental or technical bias, there are no stars. Okay, so yeah, but but that the you know another story that you might have heard. Um, I, I used to be a venture capitalist. We used to invest into a lot of different uh, forms of intellectual, or not forms of intellectual property, but um, intellectual property in many different types of products. And we actually would invest into golf products. And you know, uh, I'm a profound golfer. I can I can break a hundred every time. Um, so I used to actually look at golf products, and, and it's very interesting because we'd bring in experts and engineers and all these different things. And uh, there was this one product that was actually a tee that had a, tivet, a pivot on it, and the tee was supposed to break, not br break into two pieces, but bend based on this pivot, right? Um, I think I can show you. I don't think we invested, though. But So you'd have a tee. Here's the pointy part of the tee. That's what goes in the ground. There would be a pivot, and then the T would extend to the part that would hold the ball. Okay? And the guy that made it, you know, he, he was such a genius, like most entrepreneurs. Um, he's like, this way the T wouldn't break, and you would save money on T's. 
Now, do you guys think a golf tee is worth, you know, uh, would you, I mean, how much money do you want to save on golf tees? It's not a billion dollar problem, right? Mike, you want to save money on golf tees? Yeah. Um, so, but most, it's funny, most patents that we invested in to, um, they were reasonably okay ideas, and the entrepreneurs that invented them were by and large idiots um, because they would, they would build something like this and, and say, well, you can save a penny instead of buying a new golf tee for a penny, right? You could have this one. Um, but, of course, what we discovered through our market research and our engineering and stuff is that because the tee would only break in a certain direction, um, it, you know, because it, it, it could only break, it could only pivot this way. It couldn't pivot toward you or wait, you know, it, it couldn't pivot this way because, you know, pivot only moves like this, right? So what we found is that you had to pay attention to which side it would break, because if you were a if you aim the T the wrong way, well then it, you would still break the pivot, pivot, and you'd break your plastic T in half, right? But we found that you would have to actually pay attention to where the pivot was, so you would have to aim the T where you wanted the ball to go, and then put it down, facing where you wanted the ball to go. So guess what? We just made every golfer do that bought this tee. No, they had to aim, aim. Vast majority of entrepreneurs just stick the ball in the ground and they basically swing. Oh, I didn't even see that sand trap there. But you know what? So suddenly we had a tee that made you a better golfer. Now, what do you think is worth more money? Save you a penny on buying a new, uh, a new wooden tee? Or saving you three strokes around? Lowering your golf score. What do you think is worth more money? Well, the, the point is you had to actually aim. And most amateurs, believe it or not, they don't aim. They're worried about keeping their left arm straight. They're worrying about out driving their buddy. They're worrying about not slicing it. They, they do everything except act. we had a tool that actually made your golf game better. And, of course, now we could charge a hell of a lot more money because every golfer wants to do that. Nobody cares about saving a penny. Nor would you want to invest into a patent that, you know, you had to spend a million dollars on so people could save a penny. Well, what are you going to sell, 20 billion, you know, <laughs> golf tees? So anyways, it's a dumb idea, but um, I think we ended up passing on it. We did the brush tee. I don't know if you guys know that one. I guess it doesn't really matter, but you had a tee like this, right? And then instead of a wooden top, it had ha hairbrush hairs. And the golf ball would sit on this. We found that, A, you wouldn't break the tee because it was sitting on top of these long hairs. But, B, um, you'd get less uh, backspin on your ball. Yeah, bristles. I think, uh, so you'd get five different tees of various lengths, and you got it in a nice leatherette carrying case. So it made you like a fancy pants. So that's the one we did, but. So if you've seen that one, that's mine. I, I invested into it. Um, so anyways, um, the long story short here of this is if you, missed, if you missed this entry, right, London Open, blah, 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 um, you were simply not aiming. You just had no idea what you were doing. That's all. Or you were not a bear. But more often than not, when you talk about a, a newer trader, they're just simply not aiming. You know, they're worried about, you know, should I trade this moving average cross? What does the RSI say? What does the CCI say? What does the ADX say? What does my mother say? Um, and you're worried about everything, but you're not even aiming. Right? You can, you can ask, a, 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 you know, it, it, if you did like one of these weekend seminars where, you know, the, the expert charges $2,000 and you sit down in a hotel conference room, right? 
I've I've done several of those over the years. Not actually not that many. To actually thinking about it, I've, I think I've done three in in the last ten years. But uh, I love it because you can sit down with an amateur trader, and he'll tell you, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And I'll start with the question: Are you a bull or a bear? And it usually is dumbfounding. They're like, well, I have no idea. <laughs> Well, uh, maybe, why don't you look at your ADX? I mean, right? So the point is, you should, before you even open your charts, you understand this? While you're booting up your computer, you should already know what you're going to do. And if you don't do that, guys, you're not trading properly. And why do I want you to trade properly? Because I have a goal in life. And that is to contribute 1,000 pips to your success. Is anybody actually taking my advice that I've shared over the last few months of doing these Friday webinars? Is anyone uh, analyzing their longer-term charts, printing them out, and writing down their bias with a felt-tip marker, a big, fat, stinky, permanent marker? Okay. Okay. So if you, had, if you had done that on a four-hour chart on this Euro USD, I am certain you would have noticed this is a 50% retracement. And that while you're booting up your computer, if you were a bear because, you know, because of this stuff, you would, have, you would have been booting up your computer and you're like, I hope, I hope the 50% holds. I hope the 50% holds. I hope the 50% holds. I hope my 50% will. Right? Right? There should be no reason that you're going to your charts going, uh, what, what, uh, what am I going to do today? You know, when I do webinars, I'm often asking people, what are you going to do tomorrow? Are you doing that today? Setting up tomorrow's trades? Why would you be looking at your charts trying to figure out what you want to do now? Does that sound like a successful uh, currency trader? What, what do you think the professionals do? I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I just, I wonder. I, I might be long Euro USD. I might be short. Mm, I just really don't know. So, like this week, this week's been interesting because I'm a bear, as you know. And guess what? I shorted this. You know, it only dropped 100 pips, and then it failed. So does that mean I'm a bull? So I asked people at that uh, when this was rising, and I love asking this question. I asked, did anything fundamentally change? Is the Fed suddenly going to go back into quantitative easing and the ECB is going to immediately stop and start jacking up interest rates? I mean, did, did, did the world just turn inside out, upside down? So why would my trading behavior change? if the world didn't change. I mean, have some conviction, right? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything, every losing trade. So what's the message? If you're a bear, find the next level of resistance. Well, how about the 50%? Oh, but it only, it only stayed there for 24 hours, Wayne. I need more time than that, right? Now, it's a little dangerous where we are now because what a bear wants to see is a lower, low, lower, high scenario, right? Huh? So we got to be careful, but you can sell high. So it's a 50% retracement. Is there anything else going on at that level that could be considered resistance? So I have the 50% FIB, 
what else is going on there that, that might be a resistance? One ten psych level, okay. Pivot point cluster, roll reversal, daily twenty one. All right. So once again, if you've already established your bias, as you were booting up your computer and you were saying to yourself, I hope I can sell the Euro USD. I hope I can sell the Euro USD. I hope I can sell the Euro USD. You know what you want to do. You know you're in a good area because you printed this chart out days ago. Now you're just wondering if, if today's your important. Well, yeah, less important divergence, but what does this tell you? It tells you the, the bulls are getting out of this trade, right? The ones that have been in this all week are, are taking profit, right? That's all it's saying. It's not it's not stopping you. Yeah, so that yeah, you're right. It's less important. It's inf good information. It's relevant. But it wouldn't put you in a trade, but it's certainly not keeping you out of a trade, right? Yeah. So once again, guys, I think if you had already established all of this, you'd already fib this, and you know here, here, and here are all areas you're interested in. You're using oscillators, you're using time of day, and all this kind of stuff. Now, the um, that you would have gotten that, right? That's what I'm trying to say. If you're trading properly, that's an easy trade. That's just pips in the bank. Um, what we don't know at this point is whether there's going to be follow through. So maybe you, on days like this, you're a day trader where you're just in it for each individual move. But once you can get lower than this low, um, so let's say it does this, it does this, it does this, it does this, it does this. Um, you know, once you get through this low, you feel a lot better. Once you get lower than that low, you're all good, right? So I wouldn't drink the Kool-Aid yet as far as the follow-through. This certainly could go up to the 618. But you're still going to trade it, right? All right. So now we go back to into the context of price action. Okay, the 50% held again. Oh, but Wayne, the London Open went one pip higher, so I had to walk away. Oh, Wayne, you know, it, we were still five pips away from the, the psychological level of 110, so I, I had to walk away. Just to never hit my number. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, were there entries in, in these trades? Dry your tears away. Okay. Um, let's see. This one would have been difficult, okay? But, again, if you've noticed, if you noticed that you missed your obvious entry, after the bearish engulfing candle, you're like, oh, snap, that's it. Hey, London can be like that, right? Just, boom, takes off. So what you do is you wait for a pullback on the five-minute, right? Was this a good enough pullback? You know what? Probably not. You were probably waiting for this, right? Oh, snap, it dropped again. Well, that's what London's like. But I believe this one's catchable, this one here. Okay. Because you could have had one here. Um, actually, this one's even catchable, too. It broke below the, the daily central, and this could have been your sell zone. Okay, now we're talking about scalping again, right? You're using a five-minute chart. Now, how, am I trading because of the five-minute chart? No. I'm trading because my four-hour chart. I'm trading because uh, over the last three weeks, this is a 50% retracement, and I'm a hardcore bear based on global macroeconomics. So I'm not doing any of this because of the five-minute chart. So here's the big move, 
right at the London Open. You were ready to go, and for some reason, you didn't pull the trigger. No! Oh! Breaks below the central pivot point. It does come back. You could have scalped it. Then what? New lower low. Then what did it do? Came back. Could have scalped it. Made a new lower low. Came back. Could have scalped it. Each one of them not quite enough, though, right? That's the thing. So you would have had to have been aggressive. But but look at some of these entries, guys. It broke below the psychological level of 50, the midpoint psych level. Do you think that's worthy of scalping on the retracement? Of course, absolutely, without a doubt. Or, you know, often what I do is I'll... I'll do I'll do these, right? So that one's not quite, but you had the daily central. So then I'll move it next one here to here. Okay, 50%. Cool, caught that one. Come down to here. Measure from that one. It's perfect 3A2. Cool, next. Right? So on and so forth until it fails. Now, once once the price action fails on these little five-minute swings, do you know what actually is happening? The, the swing, not the swing traders, the spot traders are setting up their trades. So imagine now you're on a 15-minute chart and you sold this. Okay? So you trade it down and you exit at the daily support one. Seems pretty reasonable, right? And you did it on a 15-minute chart. So now what are you waiting for if you traded this, guys? If you sold at the London Open and you got out at the DS1 and you're a spot trader, what would you like to do now as a bear? Give me a basic trading strategy. I don't want to change the time frame, but you'd basically be trading on a 15-minute chart versus a 5-minute chart. 5-minute chart would be a scalper. A 15-minute chart would be a, a spot trader. A spot trader I define as someone that's in the trade for two hours. What would you do, guys? Come on. Well, don't. I want you to be more specific. You know, DeVista, I'm very tough on, on language. Retracement. What kind of uh, wait for a retracement? A thousand percent retracement? Somewhere between the three eight two and six one eight Fibonacci retracement. Thank you. No more. Try your tears away. All right. So you're basically looking at this, right? Come on now. Right. So what you're saying to me? What the beast is so saying correctly? is that you would want to sell a retracement and that even though we're down here at the London Lunch, what you're looking for is a trade like this. But you're not trading the five-minute chart. You're trading this one. Beep. Okay? And the only thing that's changed, I mean, it's the same pattern we just traded three times if you're a scalper. But not everyone can scalp, right? But a spot trade is something that you're supposed to be able to catch. I mean, it's sort of kind of your job, right? And each one of these cycles lasts two hours. So, again, look at the London Open, guys, and, and, and try to convince me that that's not catchable. It's only catchable if you don't know what the heck you're doing. If you had been waiting all night if you're an American, right, all night to sell that at the London Open, then that's just unbelievably easy, just ridiculous easy, right? It's only difficult if you don't have the work ethic to set that up ahead of time or, the, or the, just the, the knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge, that's why I'm here. I want, you to, I want you to get angry that you missed that. You're like, what the hell was I doing? That's what I would want. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to get you to change your behavior. I want you to succeed. Do you understand that? If 
Yeah. Uh, well, Ozzy's been a slower one, but yeah. Okay. But do you guys actually understand that? I actually want you to succeed. When you, when, uh, when you meet with other experts here at FX Street, do they ever try to sell you something? I'm not trying to belittle them. I'm just, I don't know. Is there always an upsell? Like, if you want more of this, um, you can join my $300 a month trading group. Uh, I do this every day for free. I want you to succeed. So if I say something, I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm not trying to make you feel stupid. I want you to succeed. So if you missed this, you were not a bear or you just didn't do your homework. That's it. If you were a bull, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, so I have nothing to sell you. I only want you to succeed. So I'm begging you to, at least on a demo account, play around with the advice I give you. Okay. So this is what a spot trader would be looking at, guys. And notice there's a, you know, typical, you know, roll reversal stuff going on there. There's pivots. I want to get rid of that fib. Should I? No, I probably shouldn't. Um, so, you know, it's even a retest of the 3A2, uh, the weekly central pivot point, the roll reversal, um, the, the micro 3A2 on top of the macro 3A2. Okay, and hopefully this continues down. That's what a spot trader would be doing. So as a scalper now, you pay attention to that. Okay? You say, okay, and I actually do this in my mind. I say, okay, it's the 15-minute chart now. Okay. I actually say that. You know, uh, I, I do a couple of different things when I'm scalping um, as far as exits. Um, it, in the summer, one of the things that I love to do is I'll just throw down like a 25-25 OCO or a 20-20 OCO. And I just, I, I call it putting. And, the, and putting, the story of putting comes from um, um actually Phil Mickelson, a golfer, and it was reported one time that every single day he takes out 100 golf balls and he, and he makes these short little putts, the ones that you should be able to make with your eyes closed. But imagine now you're, you're, you're four and a half, you have a four and a half foot putt to win a, a major tournament worth millions of dollars, but it's also very, very, very important to your legacy. You have to make this four-and-a-half-foot putt. And it's a little squirrely of a putt, but you have to make it. So how do you have confidence versus self-sabotage? Because, you know, very often when you're making that putt, you're thinking, man, it's going to go left. It's going to go left. I'm going to miss this left. I'm going to miss this left. I'm going to screw up the tournament. I'm going to miss it. I'm going give it, to give it away. I'm going to blow this. There's, you know, and then what do you do? Putt it right. Oh, I shouldn't have hit it that way you know you know versus the mindset that says i'm going to nail this and i'm going to win this tournament and i'm going to i'm going to secure my legacy for all time and so one of the things he does is every single day he makes one of these like four foot putts he has to make a hundred of them in a row and if on the 82nd one he missed he has to start over just, just bang out a hundred of them, and I, I, that type of trading I, I call putting. 
where I'll throw down a twenty a twenty twenty OCO, for example. I mean, if you can't make twenty pips on a trade, it's just pathetic. It's embarrassing, right? So you should be able to, with your eyes closed, throw down a trade. I mean, if you lost twenty pips on the scalp, <laughs> but if you can't make twenty pips on the scalp, the same thing. It's like, oh my god, what am I doing? So uh, a twenty twenty OCO is very easy. You just go put twenty pips. Maybe it goes a little farther, but it doesn't matter. You'll catch the next one. Boom! Make another twenty pips. Next. And typically, what you can do is uh, usually in like a London Open, you make about three, two or three, and then you'll move away, wait for the New York Open, make two or three, and you're done. That's typically how I handle that. Okay, Ben. And the other reason I do that is using limits to get out is I find the over the course of, if, you know, if you look at 100, if you look at, let's say, hundreds of your, of your scalps, what happens is your exits are, are imperfect, right? How could you possibly know the exact place to get out? Because you're moving at, your moving averages are way too slow. You don't even use moving averages when you're scalping, really. Um, your oscillators are too slow. I don't even really use them when I'm scalping. Um, th they're little bounces, right? And if, you're, if your trades are only, let's say, somewhere between 15 and 25 pips um, on these scalps, um, waiting for a technical sign that it, it's pulled back, you're, you've given about half of your profit back, right? By the time it's come back 10 pips, you're like, well, I should have just got out at 20. Right? And if you look at hundreds of your trades, you, you, you inevitably give back 30 to 50% of your, of your profits. Now, if you reanalyze all your trades and say, well, what if I just got out at 20 pips? Because the vast majority of them should give you 20 pips, but it's amazing how they don't give you much more than that before they come back. Right? So basically three, you know, three red candles in a row on a five-minute chart, which would be one big red candle on a 15-minute chart. Then what happens next on a 15-minute chart? It's followed by a small green candle, right? So what I end up doing is playing the law of averages. Every once in a while you make a scalp, you get out at 20 pips profit, and it goes about 33 pips. But the way I, I, I sleep at night is I say, well, I would have stayed in the trade hoping for 50, and it would have come back and knocked me out at 25 anyway. So who really cares? There is no spoon. You understand? None of it exists anyways, especially if you're, like, reporting back to investors. They're not going over every trade, and they're like, Wayne, man, you could have got 33 on that trade, and you only got 25. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. All they see is, how much money did you make me? And you're like, well, I made you 10%. And they're like, well, why didn't you make 20%? And then the next month you make 20%, and they're like, how come you didn't make 30%? Nobody cares, and whatever you do is not good enough. And God forbid you lose 2%, they're like, oh, the world's over. You've made, I'm up 40% for the year, but you just lost 2% this month. My gosh, I'm going to take my money and go somewhere else. Right? So that's what it's like trading other people's money. So why don't you just make money? There's no, <clears throat> excuse me. There's no glory in Forex, right? So the way I look at it is after analyzing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of my scalps, just throw down a 2020 OCO. Just pick up 20, 20 here, 20 there, whatever. Who cares? And again, if you can't make 20, your, your trade was pretty pathetic. And if you've lost more than 20, holy smokes, what went wrong? Oh, well, news came out or I just totally missed something, but if you're trading in the direction of the long-term bias, it seems to me you just can't lose 20 pips, right? Right? You understand? <clears throat> and I find that that's extra true in the summer. Now, I think we've had a as they say in Georgia, a blessed summer. Um, the, 
the average daily ranges are smaller than they used to be, but we've had really good trading for summer months. Very, very good trading. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for, for that. And like you can see here, I, I could see at least two pretty easy trades, right? Um, you should have done something at the London Open to trade this down. And there's been a couple of retracements, but even if you didn't scalp, you should have been short up in here. You know, they're not huge, but you certainly could have made, if you were scalping at the bare minimum, right? If you did a 25-25 OCO on the open, you should have made 25 here, and you, you would have made 25 there, and you're, you know... Well, actually, that's not even 25, is it? So hopefully you can catch the next cycle. Okay. How long, how long must I sing this song? So there's, that's that. Um, would you like to cover another currency pair? I don't have much time. Um, uh, dear moderator, may we have extra time today? I'm sorry. It's I know it's my fault. It might have been Microsoft's fault, though. Um, yeah, we only have five, okay? We got some other guy coming in. All right. Sometimes you let me go to the top of the hour. Um, all right, that's cool. Well, who is it? Maybe we'll make them wait. <laughs> Was it Sam? Forget it. Make them wait. Take a number. Um, so anyways, um, an Aussie... Yeah, okay, Ozzy, once again, once again, um, the bias should be easy, right? But it, it you know, we, we know the Reserve Bank of Australia has told us this. Um, here's the trade plan that I set you up with, um, oh, I don't know, a while ago now, right? Notice that we're about to hit our target. How many people remember setting this up? This is a daily chart now. This is me setting you up on a swing trade. And this is up on YouTube as well. I gave like six examples on how to swing trade. Notice it's exactly the same as how I trade a five-minute chart or a 15-minute chart. Okay? And that's called fractal geometry where you know, in the price-time continuum, because, you know, price and time is always the same. The only, the only difference is the way that you observe the time and price continuum. But look at that, guys. The 382 predicts the 1618, and we just hit that. Look at that. So the question often, the difficult question is, if you're trading a small time frame, like how do you get in on these moves here and here? Well, m maybe you shouldn't be trying to catch those moves, right? But look at this, down, 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 up, up, set. So let's look at it on a Okay, so uh, time of day, so how do you want to treat this? Um, it didn't, I mean, you got a couple of opportunities here. Um, let me change my template here. Tonight, we can work it out. Tonight, we can be as one. Tonight, tonight, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh, uh, all right. So what do you think? Should you be a bull or a bear after that price action? I would suggest staying a bear. Come on, WebEx, get out of my way. There we go. Okay. So what do you think of 
Once you make a lower low, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to fib it and look for an opportunity to sell somewhere between the 3A2 and 618 Fibonacci retracements. Okay. Am I making this up on the fly, guys? Or is this something that you hear 20 times every single day when we work together? Trade in the direction of the fundamental or technical bias. Once it makes a new move, you identify the 3A2 to 618. Okay. So I'm not making it up. This definitely could be your trade. And then, of course, look at the scalper. Scalps this, drops, doesn't get it. Comes again, move, right? Once again, an opportunity. Up, once again, another opportunity. Okay? Now it's made a low. Well, I want to point a couple of things out, and then we're almost out of time. On the small time frames here, like a five-minute, Look at once you get a lower low, which we would have done around here, what's the first thing that you should do? You're prepared to sell the retracement back into that zone, right? Right? Isn't that what we do over and over and over and over again? Sell that somewhere between the 3A2 and 6 8 Now we're talking about scalping. Not everybody can do this, but that's definitely something that you should have set up. And notice it's all built on the um, this area, really. So even if you don't use the FIB, you should be eyeballing that, right? Okay? Then what does it do? Now it's made a new lower low on the higher time frame, right? So what do you, what's the trade scenario now if you're a bear? Okay, I would look at it in that point. Okay. That would be most ideal. Like, let's say up to the 618. And uh, down to the next level. Okay, that'd be most ideal. We'll see. So I'd like to thank FX Street for uh, allowing us this opportunity to get together every single day. If you're a client of tradersway.com, um, I do these sessions every day for you for free. Just open a demo account or fund a live account. Um, I'd like to thank FX Street and in particular the moderator for their patience. Um, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's Microsoft's fault. But I do apologize for my technical problems. Um, but I got here today. Uh, I never sleep in. I never quit. Um, I've been actually very tired this week uh, because I haven't been sleeping more than two hours a day. I always do my webinars. Uh, I've been sick the last uh, the week before I was sick two days, but I always do my webinars. I never, when I go on vacation, I do my webinars. I take my laptops with me. I do my webinars from hotel rooms. I came back from India with deli belly. I laid on the floor because I had diarrhea for a week and I couldn't sit up in a chair because I was so weak from not being able to consume food. But I could lay on the floor and do my webinars. I never, ever, ever, ever quit. And I'm here for you. I'm just trying to teach that success in Forex, I think, requires sickening, ridiculous work ethic. And I share that by example. So I thank you for your patience. And I thank you for waiting for another half an hour um, knowing that I won't quit on you. So thank you very much for being on my team.